Podcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, and welcome to today's webinar, Issues and Trends in EdTech in 2018. My name is Megan Raymond. I'm the Assistant Director of Programs and Sponsorship here at WCET. As we go through the webinar today, if you have any questions, please enter them into the question box. We'll be following along and make sure to get to your questions during the Q&A portion toward the end of the webcast. This webinar is being recorded and we will send you a link as well, have, as well as have it posted to the WCET website and our YouTube channel. If you'd like to follow along with the PowerPoint, just click on the handouts box and you can download the slides there. We tend to have a pretty active Twitter discussion. If you'd like to follow that, the hashtag is WCET webcast. We have a lot to get through today, so just to give you an idea of where we're headed, we'll do brief introductions. We'll share some reflections on what took place in higher ed, ed tech, and policy in 2017. We'll move on to what some significant innovations or issues will be in 2018, have a moderated panelist discussion, and then we'll get to your ideas and Q&A and conclude. Again, if you have any questions, enter them into the question box and we'll get to those. Today, we have a wonderful moderator, my friend Van Davis. He's the, associ the Associate Vice President of Higher Education Policy and Research at Blackboard, Inc. Go ahead and take it away, Van. Well, good morning or good afternoon, depending upon where you are. And uh, welcome and thank you for joining us today. Uh, as Megan said, I think we're going to have a very lively conversation. Uh, I'm going to ask each of our speakers to briefly introduce themselves, and then we'll sort of jump into things. Um, Michael, why don't we start with you? Sounds good. Delighted to be with you all today. Um, name is Michael Horn. I'm the uh, Chief Strategy Officer at Entangled uh, uh, Ventures. We're a group that works in a variety of ways with higher ed institutions uh, to help them innovate uh, and help them with strategy and innovation as well out of Entangled Solutions. And I'm also the co-founder and remain a distinguished fellow at the uh, Clayton Christensen Institute for Disruptive Innovation, a nonprofit think tank uh, where we focus on the future of education. Amy? Yeah, hi, good afternoon on my time. Um, my name is Amy Lightman. I am a swamp person. I live and work in Washington, D.C. Uh, so I work in a think tank called New America, and uh, I focus mostly on issues of quality and transparency in higher education, and my work in particular focuses mostly on federal policy, and I've done a lot of work on how federal policy can seed um, and scale uh, quality innovation um, through its policy. So delighted to be here. Thanks. Hi, I'm Sasha Dackberry. Right now, I'm the Assistant Vice President for Academic Technology and New Learning Models at Southern New Hampshire University, um, where I really focus on both kind of the ed tech pieces behind um, some of our some of our newer types of learning models. Well, thank you all. I think we're going to have a really great conversation with these three folks uh, this afternoon. I just want to frame that conversation very quickly, though, with some reflections on what has happened this last year in terms of, of higher education, and particularly in terms of educational technology and policy and quality innovation, as uh, Amy has pointed out. I think it's safe to say that about this time last year, we really didn't know what was going to happen in terms of federal higher education policy. There were a lot of unknowns going into the first year of the Trump administration. Uh, President Trump spoke um, very little about higher education while he was on the campaign trail. And one could argue he still hasn't spoken very much about higher education. Um, we have a uh, Secretary of Education that is largely inexperienced with, with higher education issues. That's quite frankly not all that unusual among Secretary of Education. Um, however, there has been very little, I think, emphasis on higher education in the Department of Ed this last year. 
uh, where the largest conversations have, even most recently as the other day, have been around school choice on the K-12 level. Uh, we did, however, I think have a surprise, or at least many of us when we were having a similar webinar this time last year, uh, would consider it a surprise. And that is that at the end of December, we saw two pieces of legislation that could potentially impact higher ed. We saw the passage of a tax bill that could impact all of higher ed, but especially uh, public higher education and community colleges with the limitation on uh, write-offs of the state and local tax. Uh, and then we saw come out of the House Higher Education Committee chaired by Representative Virginia Fox, uh, PROSPER, which is that uh, committee's version of the reauthorization of the Higher Education Act. Um, earlier today, uh, Senate HELP uh, decided to begin yet again, uh, restart hearings around uh, their ideas around the reauthorization of higher education. And uh, the chair of that committee, uh, Senator Lamar Alexander, who is an ex-Department of Ed uh, official, ex-Secretary of Education, ex-University President, has said that he hopes to have uh, the Senate's version of HEA reauthorization marked up by the end of the first quarter. Uh, and then, although we didn't see much from the Department of Ed around uh, higher ed, we did finally see uh, Ed's Office of Inspector General release their audit of Western Governors University. And with that, as Russ Poulin has written about, uh, some further confusion over the ideas of regular and substantive interaction. Meanwhile, we know that uh, the latest annual study of U.S. distance education enrollments shows that we're continuing to see education growth and conversations about affordability, uh, particularly the free college movement, did not go away, and they have kicked into high gear. And so I think that is the backdrop of 2017 that our panelists today are going to be thinking about as they talk about what they think we have to look forward to in the future. So to get us started, I'm going to start with Michael, and I'm gonna ask each of our panelists to very briefly name one issue or innovation that they think will be the most important in 2018 and why. And, and we've told them that they have three minutes before the Jeopardy music plays them off the stage. So Michael, why don't we start with you? Sure thing. I'll tell you what I'm most excited about, which I, I don't know if it'll be the most significant, but I think long-term it might be, which is the rise of mobile learning. Uh, and, and that might not even be in the formal institutions of higher education, but in the uh, post-secondary and adult learning landscapes uh, more broadly, we're, we're starting to see the emergence of new uh, companies and technologies pioneering uh, mobile learning that uh, has very sound instructional design, very active learning, uh, so pedagogically very intelligent and well-crafted, uh, and really engaging experiences that are uh, serving adults where they are with bite-sized learning in the ways that they can consume it. And I think it's gonna be a game changer uh, as we think about the next wave of disruptive uh, innovation in higher education, uh, both from an affordability perspective, from a learning design perspective, and from an efficacy perspective. And I, I think it's a pretty exciting trend that is just seeing its birth in the last couple of years with, with the rise of some of these companies and many more on the horizon that I'm starting to see that I'm getting excited about. Okay, great, Michael. Um, Amy, what are you most excited about or think will be the most significant in this coming year? Okay, so uh, so I'm definitely not answering the first part. What am I most excited about? Because I work in federal policy, so I'm not excited about anything right now. Um, but what do I think is the uh, the most um, important issue? And I'm sure we'll, we'll end up talking about this in more detail later, but I think we're really going to see at the federal level, and of course I'm going to talk about federal policy because I'm a swamp person, um, is whether or not we're actually going to see um, 
a bipartisan approach to innovation in which uh, consumer protection and innovation are seen as intertwined and as mutually reinforcing or whether or not they're going to be pitted against each other in a way that is partisan and harmful both to you know to the broader field and to ultimately students who could benefit from high quality um, innovations of a variety of kinds so um, and I think frankly you know I think it's going to be largely up to the field to weigh in on this and I'll just give a little a little story um, so I've been talking to folks in the field about you know regular and substantive and competency-based education and the need for us to have responsible innovation for a long time and in a different regulatory environment it was easy to get institutions to the table, right? Because, well, if they weren't gonna play, the federal government was gonna do it for them. Um, but we have a different regulatory environment now. And the question is, where will the field be in the absence of this looming regulatory hammer? And the day after the presidential election last November, or the November before last, um, I was uh, speaking to a group of institutions about regular and substantive interaction, and it had been it had been planned for a million years. And I think people thought we were going to have a different administration. So the question was, how are we going to talk about the need to update our federal legislation and regulations um, in a way that was responsible and that you know some folks who are really concerned about consumer protection could care about? And I sort of opened the the floor with saying, you know what, like this is not looming over you anymore. This is not going to be something that the feds are going to care about. But do you still care about it? And to a person, everyone said yes, because they were worried that if we just sort of flew, uh, threw open the floodgates without any quality controls, that it would not only harm students, but that it would be bad for, for their brands, bad for the institutions, and bad for innovation more broadly. So um, but that being said, we've seen some legislation that we'll probably talk about later. Um, and I've seen some of the people who were in that room sort of, you know, move away from that and say they support certain things and other people saying no, no, no. So I think that's going to be a thing to watch is to see how this is going to play out um, in 2018. All right, excellent. And Sasha, what are you either most excited about or think will be most significant moving into 2018 this year? Uh, so in my case, I actually think these are kind of the same thing. I'm excited to see what happens. I think what we're seeing in terms of the market, um, increased competition in online programs and also increased competition in different types of online programs, different types of partnerships, um, the changing role that MOOCs are having in kind of an almost OPM type of way, and also with uh, additional players kind of getting into that online space to really serve students who have have uh, the need for flexibility, what does that look like uh, as institutions really work on differentiating their learning experience? Um, I, I'm hoping and, and the potential that I'm excited about is, is moving away from a highly broadcast um, methodology of online learning to one that's a lot more um, consumer grade technology experience and, and a lot more engaging. I do think that some of this is going to be necessitated by price compression, additional competition in the market, um, the changing demographics of learners is going to increase the need for flexibility in terms of types of programs, learning models, um, the length of term structure, everything from the format to pricing structures, and a, a lot this innovation and market competition is, is going to be happening at the same time that a lot of institutions are really working on kind of foundational basics. And so that's something that, you know, there we still have the need for all of those kind of core pieces of online programs and kind of seeing how that market competition is going to drive different structures and different types of programs. I think that's really exciting. So I think that's a, a great segue, actually, um, Sasha, and I'm going to start with you uh, into this next, into our next question. Um, you know, I think this last year, as you said, we've seen some really interesting developments in online learning and educational technology. We're seeing the increase of OPMs. We've seen the Capella-Strayer merger, which I think it's safe to say surprised a lot of us. We saw the Purdue-Kaplan deal that surprised even more of us. Uh, Grand Canyon University has yet again um, asked their accreditor and the Department of Education to be allowed to move to a nonprofit status. 
what do you think that is going to mean for this upcoming year? Are, are we seeing the commodification of higher ed? What, how is this all going to play out? I, I think it's a little bit of both. I think we are seeing some of the commodification of it, particularly when it comes to, um, uh, particularly when it comes to some of the OPM pieces, I think that can be a little bit challenging. Um, the Grand Canyon University piece of uh, is 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 fairly similar to how some of the larger charter schools at the K-12 have have uh, occurred in some markets, which is that a nonprofit kind of halo organization contracts a long-term contract with a for-profit provider. And so it's kind of getting that tax-exempt status with an asterisk. So I think that's something to be very, very cautious about. Um, but I think for a lot of institutions, it's actually very mission central focusing on the sustainability um, and driving down the cost of higher education is, is really very critical for lots of institutions. Um, I, and I do think that the increased competition is gonna necessitate further partnerships, further mergers, um, and, and in some cases, some creative ways of thinking about how do you spin up new programs or new structures to support those programs. Uh, I, I think we're probably going to see both a shift towards more OPMs and less OPMs or different types. Um, in some cases, more of a fee for service instead of a, a revenue split. I, I think we're going to see a lot of kind of interesting things. And it, in some extent, I think it will really serve students by providing them with additional options. But I am concerned about the transparency uh, of uh, the choices that learners make as they go to either a nonprofit or a state institution that has um, a different type of mission than maybe other types of institutions. However, having said that, there are very good for-profit institutions that care very deeply about their students and have very effective educational models. So I think that's definitely a balance. For-profit isn't you know, evil and not-for-profit isn't good, but it's really a creative way of making sure that it's student-centric, and I think there's definitely a little bit of a danger in there right now. Hey, Michael, I'd love to hear your oh, thoughts sorry. on this, but, um, well, go ahead, Amy. Well, I was just gonna bolster that a little bit, what Sasha was saying, to say that, um, I mean, I, I guess two things. One, um, I think the OPMs and other things sort of show, even if enrollment is down, money can be made on things like student support services. And I think, uh, you know, there, that could go either way, right? I mean, if when they're great, they really work really well, how much of these contracts are focused on outcomes, right? And it, it's really, as Sasha was saying, all about the students. And so I think we, we need to be careful. Like, again, I think all of these things, you know, all of the sort of wraparounds and all of that can be great, but it ultimately, it, it depends on, you know, on whether or not there are outcomes that are tied to those. But I would say in terms of the sort of the broader like trend, I don't think these, like the acquisitions and the mergers is necessarily like a new trend, but at this scale, it certainly is. And it seems like we're going to see a lot more of these. Um, and particularly, and maybe we'll talk about this later, but um, in you know, there's been some interest, and certainly in the House bill, there was an interest to expand basically fully the um, EQUIP program, which would allow institutions to contract with non-institutional providers to provide up to 100% of the education and training. And so we're starting to see these very meta questions about what is higher ed, if it's not face-to-face, -face, if it's not faculty-driven, if it's not even institutionally driven or even really that much participated in, who or what is higher education and who or what is an institution? I mean, I think these questions are becoming uh, much more prominent and will be this year. I think that that um, raises some really interesting philosophical conversations that I hope we get to here in a minute. Um, I really want to hear um, Michael's take on this as well, especially in his role as both Chief Strategy Officer at Entangled Ventures, but also his ongoing role at the Clayton Christensen Institution. Um, but really quickly, Michael, we've had some questions sort of pop up in the chat box. Could you give us a, a good working definition of what we mean by OPM in all of this? Because I think that's sort of changed in the last couple of years. 
Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so OPM very very strictly uh, means online program manager. So it's basically a company that comes in and uh, helps manage an online program for an institution. And they were tremendously effective and important, I would argue, uh, a decade or two ago when online learning was this very uncertain field of, of what does it mean to be on online uh, higher ed institution? Will students show up? How much capital does it take to build an effective program and so forth? And these OPMs effectively took on a lot of that risk where they would put in the first couple million dollars to build these programs and in exchange would take a very high revenue share uh, on the back end where they would be getting 50, 60, even 70 percent of tuition uh, as their revenue uh, for essentially managing these programs. And, and the big stipulation was that the institution itself uh, had to retain academic control of the program, meaning that faculty were actually making the determinations on what should be learned, course objectives, uh, things of that nature. But the OPM could do everything from marketing the program, getting students in the door, uh, building the courses themselves and, and instructional design uh, offerings, uh, and even helping manage the uh, faculty uh, adjunct faculty that would help uh, uh, teach these courses. So, so you see in OPMs, uh, play a very significant role in the higher ed ecosystem online uh, for nonprofit and, and some public universities over the last 10, uh, arguably 20 years. Uh, I think that's about to change in some very key respects, uh, which, which maybe, Van, I'll, I'll jump into that, the original part of the question, uh, which Sasha alluded to uh, around the OPMs changing. I, I think we're going to see a pretty big disruption uh, start in that space. Uh, I think it already has started, but it's going to grow in the in the year ahead. Where people are understanding increasingly what it means to be uh, offering programs online, uh, what these different arrangements look like, how you do them, and so forth. And, and while I totally agree uh, with Sasha's point that uh, institutions' fluidity with what that means and how to do it in a high quality way is is all over the spectrum, and we still have a lot of basics to move on there. Uh, it, it's a much more well understood proposition than it used to be in market demand for those degrees is much more well understood. And so I think what you're going to see is uh, institutions moving away from paying 60%, 70% of, of tuition to an OPM uh, uh, as for, for their revenue, which I think increasingly trustees will say, holy cow, we're giving away a ton to these uh, to these providers. And you're going to start to see much more low cost fee for service models because quite frankly, the technology is a heck of a lot better than it was 10 years ago. You can uh, mix and match and put together your program in much more low cost and uh, maintaining uh, quality ways and uh, pay a lot less for it. And I think It'll be an, uh, important for the institutions that are using that revenue to support other parts of their campus, uh, but I also think it'll be important uh, from from a, a cost perspective more broadly uh, across higher ed. In the vast majority of industries, technology is used in no novel business models to often reduce costs uh, to consumers. Higher ed is one of those where it's been used to layer over existing business models and in many cases increase costs. Uh, Southern New Hampshire is the exception. They're not the rule, in other words. And so I think you're going to see uh, increasingly uh, disruptive entrance in the OPM space change that landscape. On, on the second point that you had uh, raised earlier also, Van, just on, on the for-profit question and mergers and acquisitions and so forth, my, my take on the for-profit question is that the way the, the bigger players at least are treating uh, the, the current time frame is that there's a window of opportunity for them to do one of two things, either reposition themselves uh, a la the Capella Strayer merger uh, to to be able to operate in an environment that I think in you know three years potentially um, will look very different uh, for them uh, than than it does now where there's less scrutiny uh, on them and, and a relaxation of, of some of the regulations that had been hitting them so hard and so they're using it as a window to reposition themselves or they're using it as a window to get out of the game effectively and, and, and to move into these nonprofit OPM type relationships uh, that, that will look different. And, and I think it, it's going to be interesting to follow what other creative options we see uh, come out of that space in, in, in the next couple of years. Lastly, I think that merger piece, we've written about this and entangled uh, certainly a fair bit. Uh, I, I think we're going to see an increasing number of mergers. A lot of colleges are not only asking the question of 
how do they survive in certain cases, but also asking, are there better ways to serve students in, in more mission-oriented ways? And so I think you're going to see, uh, Amy's right, there's always been mergers and acquisitions in, in the space, but I think it's going to step up significantly. Uh, Paul Friedman and Ed Surge today said he thinks it'll double uh, from, from the year before, and I, I think that's a reasonable guess of what we'll see in the year ahead. So yeah, I think that um, all of y'all have raised uh, one of the same points over and over again, and that is this issue of the quality of these relationships and how, to some extent, we balance um, these issues of quality and innovation. And Amy, I know that this is something that you've written about quite a bit, and I don't think I've yet to have a conversation with you um, in which we did not spend a lot of time talking about that. How do you see, especially in light of um, the PROSPER Act and this idea of 100%, um, how do you see us trying to get a handle on uh, balancing innovation and quality, both on campuses, but also when we start expanding the field of who is involved in offering higher education? Yeah, I mean, so how would I like us to see it is I'd like us to do it well. How I how I see it happening in the next year is not being done that well. I mean, if the the House uh, Prosper Act, which was you know passed out of committee on a bipart not a bipartisan on a very partisan vote, um, if that's any indication of where things are headed, they're headed totally in the wrong direction. And I think this is something you know. Obviously, I spend way too much time in the weeds on all of this, but. Um, you know, there are certain things in that bill that on their face, you're like, oh, maybe, you know, maybe that seems reasonable or the field has been asking for this thing or that thing. But we can't, you can't look at each individual thing in isolation. You have to look at the entire package. And the entire package of that bill, and we can talk about the Senate in a second, um, is basically just throwing open the doors and not having any quality control. So getting rid of existing regulations, um, making it impossible for the secretary to regulate on many of these things in the future, creating new opportunities for new players to come in, uh, which I would be fine with if there were some quality assurance, but there isn't any, again, with the equip uh, piece, for example, allowing um, new players to come in, uh, allowing short-term training for Pell, again, which uh, which all speaks to the need and the, the, real, the real need to better meet the needs of today's students. And some of these innovations can really do that. But the problem is, is, and we've seen this decade after decade, is that, you know, you have some really good sort of first movers who are good players who are meeting the needs of students well. And then you sort of insert, you know, millions at one point and now hundreds of billions of dollars in federal aid um, into the market without any focus on outcomes. And of course, it distorts the market. And of course, people come in and abuse it. And students are harmed. And they're able to be harmed at, a, at an unprecedented scale because of technology. So, so what that ends up doing is you end up then having this very partisan way of thinking about it. It's just like, nope, I'm going to you know, care about students, which means I'm going to be anti-innovation. Or no, I'm so for innovation, so I'm not going to care about these protections. And I don't. I don't. I think the House bill is a really bad start. Um, it, it's a terrifying start. So I am hoping that the Senate will be uh, more balanced. And so, um, so uh, Senator Alexander today talked. You know, he and Patty Murray both talked about wanting to work bipartisanly together. And I think that they are just sort of wired differently as individuals and being in the Senate. They're more inclined to work in a bipartisan way. Uh, that being said, you know, the devil will be in the details. So I think we need to, um, you know, pay attention. There, This is, uh, you know, as you mentioned today, the Senate had a hearing on financial aid um, access and uh, transparency. I'm sure we're going to see something on innovation um, because that's something they've talked about before. We might see something on accreditation, might see something about, you know, accountability, maybe safety on campuses, just thinking about the things that Senator Alexander talked about today. Um, but I think I, I think we can't we can't rely on the feds to do this in this environment well. I think it really is going to be up to um, the innovators and the institutions, not just to say, 
hey, we want these waivers and these flexibilities and this will be good for us, but to say, yes, we want waivers and flexibilities, but we also really wanna make sure that we have these protections baked in. So as folks are thinking about would this piece of legislation be good for me? I think people also have to think, okay, if I were a bad actor, what would I do with that? Um, to, and then share those concerns with policymakers. Sorry, I am on my soapbox, you're right. You can never talk to me without me talking about this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> soapbox, getting off now, um, thanks. Sa Sasha, why don't you jump in here and then I know Michael probably has something to say too. Uh, yeah, one of the things that I, I think is a part of the challenge for innovation in higher ed is it seems like the lines, um, the guardrails that we have keep shifting and the interpretation of what those guardrails are for innovation keeps shifting. And one example is the OIG report. The, the entire challenge the field has had with defining regular and substantive interaction and, and it, it, even within the current boundaries, which, which we all sort of collectively agree don't necessarily support the kind of innovation we want to see, you still see folks innovate within those guardrails. And, and some part of me uh, really wishes that we could just have the same guardrails or the same interpretation of the same guardrails because higher education institutions um, are are highly innovative. There are lots of, even though, you know, we haven't managed to truly really decouple from the Carnegie unit and there's very few direct assessment CBE programs, all of those things are very true. But if you look across, you also see a lot of very interesting things happening within the guardrails. And, and there's some gymnastics that need to happen to make sure that, you know, those align with federal regulations. But part of the challenge for institutions is that the, the interpretation of what the current guidelines mean continually shifts. And that doesn't provide a good, um, good you know, foundation that people can build creatively on. Uh, and, and to some extent, I, I'm hopeful that, um, with every transition of administration or, you know, collective thought processes, there there comes this accompanying um, transformation of what what hoops institutions have to jump through to justify the innovation that they're already doing or to grow the innovative programs that they already have. And uh, if, if there could be some stability of interpretation or some stability within that, I actually think we would see more of this innovation coming from within institutions as opposed to being put on institutions from, you know, these additional ideas about partnerships or these additional, you know, providers coming in to provide everything from, you know, soup to nuts and then branding it as something else. So I, I think that if we were able to have some stability it, it would actually really help because I, I think a lot of faculty and a lot of uh, institutions are, are really increasingly recognizing that maybe what has worked in the past doesn't work for a contemporary student base, doesn't work for a future forward world, and that needs to evolve. Michael, I, how do you see this um, innovation versus quality assurance playing out and 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 what do you think this means yeah. in terms of as Sasha's pointed out challenges for institutions with the the guardrails not in place yeah look there there's some things we know from the research on innovation and and Sasha is exactly right which is that when there's lack of certainty it causes people to uh, pull back from investment in innovations because they don't know if they'll get their hands slapped what where the where the rules are and not uh, investors and and entrepreneurs and actors uh, who who would be interested in innovation uncertainty is not a comfortable place for them to be and 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 it tends to depress activity and there there's a rich body of research on that so totally agree with that point i think uh, in in terms of the broader conversation between consumer protection and innovation uh, i i frankly i find it to be one of the most bizarre conversations that continues to exist and, and i i get why it exists um, because it feels like a tension um, but to amy's point it's 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 a polarization once something goes wrong and we've put in really bad incentives in the beginning and and from my perspective when you innovate you're innovating toward an outcome no one would ever buy an iphone uh, if it was a terrible product and and so in, in essence you are paying for an outcome 
And we've basically told uh, from the federal government pers- federal government perspective, we've been very input based funding seat hours, uh, credit hours of students moving into institutions and really pulled back from the outcomes conversation. So we constantly are sitting there debating the inputs. What's a competency based program? What's not? What's the right amount of faculty interaction? What's not? And we constantly go back and forth between these polls. And and what I'd much rather see is really a truly a focus on outcomes. you know, are, are we getting students to where they want to go and uh, and, and doing so in a way that's responsible for, for them and, and for the taxpayer uh, from a fiscal perspective? And so I, I think three things occur to me in, in this conversation. One, I think I think the good news, Amy, I, I'm I'm further removed from this uh, from the swamp world than you are. So so I hope uh, you, you'll breathe a little bit uh, deeply for, uh, on this one. But, you know, the House version uh, of, of an HEA reauthorization, I think the good news is it's not going to pass in that form. Uh, I, I personally am skeptical that anything will pass in 2018, which I don't think is a good thing. But uh, but I, I think regardless, because of the way the Senate works, uh, we're going to see a very different bill ultimately move forward that will be more balanced. I think that's good news. Uh, the second thing is I'd love a reframe on the quality assurance side uh, to one of creditworthiness. I, I think it could get more Republicans uh, I- interested in this conversation uh, around quality assurance and not just writing a blank check to institutions who can then uh, put in really bad incentives uh, in, or puts in really bad incentives in place for students uh, to think much more about creditworthiness and operating like any other market would. We, we wouldn't just lend to a provider uh, that had bad outcomes uh, and, and, and was unlikely to see a return on the investment. And so I, I think if we could reframe it somehow around that, I, I wonder if we would get more uh, bipartisan buy-in. And, and then the third thing I think is really focusing on outcomes and not stringently defining, uh, you know, some of the meta questions Amy was asking, I, I think are, are, are quite interesting, but I think they're very difficult for federal legislation to, to deal with. And, and so I personally, and I, I might be in the minority here, but I'd love to see uh, programs move much more toward uh, income-based repayment schemes on, on federal financial aid with, with some risk sharing for the institution. So there's a natural built-in uh, guardrail uh, that, that is priced uh, appropriately to, to prevent against bad behavior that's strictly focused on outcomes. Are we helping students move to where they are? I'll put in one last plug. Uh, Amy and I have been serving on a task force around a nonprofit uh, education quality assurance standards uh, to try to create some of this a- uh, uh, activity in a voluntary way, uh, hoping the federal government will move forward, but but knowing that it could be difficult. And so uh, I, I think Amy's right that the innovators themselves, in many cases, have to put these guardrails in place, not five years from after they've started innovating, that's too late, but literally from the get-go so that the right incentives exist and that they're self-policing their field, knowing that if they don't, there'll be a big blowback on them at some point. Yeah, uh, this is Amy, I would say. Uh, so I have lots of amens and plus ones and yeses to all of that and had, you know, scribbled outcomes, outcomes, outcomes on a post-it as people were talking. So, I mean, I agree with um, with, uh, well, with both of you that uh, that we need to focus on outcomes. The problem is that has been not just input-based, but we've been focused on modalities and we need to focus on outcomes. But the problem is, is that uh, there's more federal appetite to focus on getting rid of like distinctions between modalities than there is on focusing on outcomes. So it's sort of like, and I'm sorry to use a super partisan example, but I feel like it is, um, it's um, relevant. It's sort of like repeal and replace versus just repeal. <laughs> you know, it's like, if we're going to get rid of one thing, what are we going to replace it with? And, and I think this speaks to Sasha's points about how the guardrails keep shifting and how it, um, it would be good to have guardrails for all that would be the same. And while theoretically, I agree with you, and from a policy perspective, I absolutely agree. I mean, I think we should have an outcomes focus. We should have outcomes focus for everyone in higher education. The truth is, in terms of politics, that's really hard because incumbents who have not been uh, used to focusing on outcomes don't really want to. So in some ways, that's what the innovation space allows for, is for new actors to come in and say, okay, we're willing to be held accountable for outcomes if you waive all this other stuff. And so um, that we don't need, we don't need this input-based stuff. We don't need this modality stuff, but we will be held accountable for the outcomes. And then that's good for both them and for the students. And then I think actually helps 
inform a broader conversation within the broader higher education field of, oh, why are we focusing on all, what should we be focusing on? But I think it's a sort of, there's some political sequencing that needs to happen, but ultimately, yeah, we need to be focusing on outcomes. But the problem is that's not what, um, you know, Congress really wants to do. And so while yes, the House bill, I hope, and I'm knocking on my fake wood desk as I say this, uh, will not actually be the bill that goes through. Um, it does give us a starting point, but I think the Senate, the Senate will not be as bad, I hope. Um, and, uh, but these are all still very important conversations to have, but to the extent that the field can focus and say, not just we want waivers from these archaic regulations and laws, but we wanna focus on outcomes. I think that will be helpful and allow us to get past this false dichotomy of innovation and consumer protection. Ben, I know you're about to jump in. I just want to say plus one to everything Amy said. I totally agree. <laughs> so as, as much as I could stay in the policy wonk weeds all day, um, I'm going to move us in a little bit of a different direction and talk about technology in um, the classroom at, at institutions. And I want to start with you, Sasha. Gartner, you know, Gartner has been... Um, has been talking a lot about learning analytics. They have that at the peak of the hype cycle, but a number of other tech innovations from the last few hype cycles have either fallen off entirely or gone into the trough of disillusionment. Um, what do you think from where you're sitting over at Southern New Hampshire, what do you think that um, we have to look forward to in terms of educational technology in 2018 and especially educational technology that institutions can actually afford and implement? Oh, so that's a very good question because those are two very different things, right? <laughs> um, so I, I, I think the, the talk about learning analytics is, is particularly um, fascinating because d institutions do it so dramatically differently. And obviously, as Southern New Hampshire University looks at um, data, data reports all the time. They pull these analytics from the various systems, remix them, and can make predictions about student success. So I'd say in that aspect, um, and there's a consistent course environment, so that I think that's a little bit ahead of the curve. I would say, though, that that uh, some of the ways we're even thinking about analytics work better in specific models when there's a lot of variation between how classes are designed, developed, and delivered. Some of the learnings that we can take um, may be a little bit less relevant because there's so much diversity in terms of what the learner experience actually is. It actually and, and, and it requires a lot of institutional investment in these different systems and an integration and um, you know even moving to things like you know middleware and and being able to get real-time data as opposed to historical data. Um, when is that information usable when can you intervene before you even before the student even knows they're in trouble and i think the majority of institutions actually are, are not close to leveraging that technology really it's a, a, a lot of the infrastructures of these institutions aren't built that way yet uh, and i don't know how exactly how um, those decisions are going to be made about investments because you can purchase a learning analytics system or bring folks in to help you create that, but uh, to, to what end? Like, how do we make that outcomes focused? How do you make sure that the innervation, in, uh, intervention matters? And separately from, so, you know, um, SNU, what SNU is doing, which is, is pretty important work, I, I think that we have some interesting assumptions in the field that we make about what data matters. Um, I'm a little bit of a, a, a geek about some podcasts, and I, I listen to the Freakonomics podcast a lot, and there was this uh, research that was done a few years ago on what type of customer service representatives um, were the most, uh, had the most longevity in, in some sort of position. And the, what they discovered is that it wasn't what you would consider to be typical demographic or, or other types of uh, basic data points that didn't have anything to do with their level of experience or, um, you know, their degree or their preparation coming in. It had to do with the browser that they used when they applied for the position. So they, they discovered that um, applicants who used the default browser, like IE or Safari, uh, were retained 
for less time in that in that position um, versus those who had applied using a non-default like a you know a Firefox or a Chrome and while we don't exactly know why I think those are the types of questions and that's the types of data that we need to be looking at perhaps commonalities among student behaviors aren't those that we most typically associate with demographics. You know, there's a lot that we already know that you don't need learning analytics to tell you. We know a lot about the risk of your socioeconomic status on your outcomes. We know a lot about the predictive um, capability of your high school GPA. So some of this stuff, maybe we're asking some questions that we've already answered and maybe we're not asking some of the right questions, but I do think there tends to be all of this buzz around it and it's actually very hard to do. Michael, what do you think? Yeah, so I'm I, lo looking at this, a, a, a couple thoughts occur to me. One, I think it's true uh, that adaptive learning, big data, things like that got a tremendous amount of hype uh, a few years ago. And what I think we've realized is that uh, is a few things. One, uh, uh, education is an immensely, and, and learning, I should say more broadly, is an immensely more complicated thing uh, than recommending uh, your next movie on Netflix uh, or, or what you next want to buy on Amazon. And we should also be very clear that Amazon is probably wrong at least 50% of the time on that recommendation for you. And learning is a much more high, uh, much more high stakes uh, set, of, set of decisions. And so the, the challenge with data in general is that by its definition, it's always backward looking. Uh, it can't tell you, there's no data about the future. And, and so what we do is we use data to help us test hypotheses and construct theories that we can use to predict the future. And I, I think a lot of institutions haven't uh, uh, engaged in that as much as they should. And, and part of the challenge has been the modality when they've used online learning uh, of, 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 of engaging in this world, when that online learning has been in a broadcast model, which uh, Sasha talked about earlier. So I'm, I'm just taking my lecture and, and maybe I'm chunking it up in shorter videos, but I'm still just broadcasting out at you without a very active learning pedagogy or lots of interactivity. You're basically cutting off the ability to really use data uh, in, in, in enormously effective ways that may be counterintuitive in certain cases. Um, and so I guess I'm not all that surprised that a lot of these uh, data-driven uh, applications have, have sort of uh, f fallen into the trough of, of, of disillusionment. I think learning analytics has been a little bit more premised on some of those behaviors outside of the learning environment itself, and so that's why there's been a little bit more stickiness to it. Uh, and but but I'm I, I think it could fall that way uh, very quickly as well, based on institutions' readiness to use and, and quite frankly some of the limitations I just talked about. The the other thing that I think is interesting is what we're seeing in the field more generally is that online learners not only continue to enroll close to institution, uh, and there's exceptions like Southern New Hampshire, Arizona State, and so forth, but for the most part, they, they tend to enroll within 100 miles of where they live. Uh, th that trend has actually grown over time, not decreased. And, and I think it'll continue to as people view education not just as a commodity in what I learn, but also the networks and the other uh, collaborative uh, exchanges I get out of it. And then I think it also then raises a question as we think about rural America and places that don't maybe have the connectivity uh, that we would uh, that we would hope for some of these online learning programs, what does that do from an equity uh, perspective? And I, I think I, I'm personally bullish. I think we'll continue to see improvements in that space. I think the move toward mobile learning applications that take less bandwidth and can be consumed on your phone will mitigate against this to some degree as well. Uh, but I think it's an issue that institutions need to continue to think about uh, also as, as, as they're moving into this environment. All right, thanks, Michael. So we're going to start fielding some questions from the audience, and I, I'm calling this the speed round. Um, so short and sweet, guys. I'd like to move through as many as we can. Amy, I'm going to start with you here. We had a question earlier um, from uh, Brian, and he wrote, uh, government-controlled student loans and grants have driven up the cost of higher ed. If the government offers more, the colleges and universities have charged more. Is there not an argument to shut down government student loan programs and turn back to market competition? 
sweet. Short and sweet. Okay. Um, no. Uh, so, <laughs> so I do think I do think in certain areas, like whether uh, for graduate student loans, for example, or for um, parent plus loans, I do think the government needs to sort of rein it in because I think that's where we see some of the out of control pricing. And I mean, there's a that's a much longer conversation. But no, in terms of cutting off access to allowing the market to work for students for whom higher education is most important, many of those students, um, whether or not they're 18 year olds, 25 year olds, 35 year olds, um, who are trying to improve their, you know, their social mobility, have low to no credit who would not get loans in the private marketplace. They would not get um, good terms in the marketplace. So while I do believe, you know, there's a much broader and longer conversation to have about the role of, of federal dollars and debt and whether or not we should be spending more money on grants and um, like that's a different conversation, but to just get rid of the loan program would mean denying access to the students who most need higher education. Okay. Not that I have um, feelings so, about it. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you think I threw this one to you, Amy? So I think one of the things that's interesting is that there has been actually a lot of talk about access and equity um, so far today. So not surprising that we've had um, some questions about accessibility and um, within the context of ADA. Um, somebody want to weigh in on where they think we're going to be going this coming year uh, as institutions try to figure out how to make content the most accessible to all learners. So this is Sasha, I can jump in here. Um, I, I think that the accessibility piece is, is very important for a couple of reasons. Um, the first is obviously for students who need the video that's closed captioned or they need the alternative description or you know they need to be able to access the publisher resource a different way. Um, but it's also very important just for quality in general uh, for you know the ability of, of all different students and in in a lot of ways for our new majority of students you know our our non-traditional students if someone can you know download an audio file to listen while they're on their way to work that actually does improve access as opposed to having to sit down and and read the article they can listen to it but that actually requires a, a pretty decent investment on the front end because a lot of courses particularly online courses that are legacy courses that are courses that have kind of been copied over year after year those courses uh, become extremely difficult in practice to go back and retrofit for accessibility. So in many of these cases, institutions will probably need to be setting up structures that can support the redesign of those courses and make them accessible on the front end. Um, it's really not something that you cannot do, but it's definitely something that most institutions haven't solved yet. Now, again, the technology has improved so much. So the prices for closed captioning have come down. The prices for development tools, like what, what is it cost to actually um, you know, create multimedia, all of those costs have come down. Down, which is good but there's also still a bunch of legacy content out there that's going to need to be grappled with because it's not just for a, a, a student who has a different need it's it, it's actually just good pedagogy in general to you know provide multiple ways of showing content provide multiple ways of engaging with content and and even things from universal design for learning like figuring out um, how to link in the motivation component with it and goal setting these are all really critical things that are expensive <laughs> excellent um, Michael I think you might be interested in fielding this next one and I suspect actually that Amy and Sasha are going to want to weigh in on this too. Um, we've got somebody that has um, raised this issue of will one of the trends in, in 2018 be um, a continued sort of move or emphasis on skills versus especially four-year degrees? Yeah, so I, th I think this is an interesting one. I, my, my answer would be I wish it will continue to uh, move in the direction. And I think marginally it will, uh, but I think it'll be slower than many people expect. And, and the reason is uh, fundamentally, as I look at the landscape, 
employers are unbelievably inarticulate about the actual knowledge and skills that lie at the heart of successful employees in different roles. And so when you look at uh, their job postings and things of that nature and what they po put put up there, they they resort to things that actually often fall back on degrees, uh, A, and B, uh, are, are not necessarily identifying the skills that are actually at the heart of being successful. They're just things that they think that they ought to say uh, in, in a way to screen applica applicants and so forth. And as long as we're uncertain about the actual skills, competencies, et cetera, at, at the base of those uh, employer needs, there's just going to be uh, the, the signal is not going to be complete to move more toward a competency-based marketplace uh, that, that is much more interested in, in that. I think the one break that, that occurred in 2017 that I'm excited about, and, and full disclosure, an advisor and an investor in this company, but Degreed, uh, w which uh, they say that they're trying to jail, jailbreak the degree, they introduced a uh, skill certification uh, into the marketplace for, for employers to verify what skills you, you do through a very similar uh, uh, psychometric process as, say, Western Governors University would uh, use in the assessment of competencies. And I think that could be a, a just a game changer if we start to understand more deeply what are the competencies and allow education institutions to more uh, uh, directly target and build programs around those competencies as opposed to uh, a more surface level treatment where we are today. Amy, I think yeah, you have some thoughts here too. Yeah, so um, in keeping with the spirit of this uh, webinar, plus one to what Michael said, um, on all, I mean, on all of those parts, um, Unfortunately, because we are not good at identifying skills either from the employer side or the institutional side, um, you know, we still do have this this real heavy bias towards um, the signal, you know, the sort of sheepskin effect of the four-year degree. And so all of the things that Michael said, and I'm just going to add a further worry because I guess I'm the worrier here, uh, I think we're also starting to see a push it's not a four-year degree versus skills, but now it's starting to be any completion versus skills. And I'm fine with completions of skill-based credentials that are less than four-year degrees, but I think we're seeing more and more of a push towards these short-term certificates, which again, if they're skills-based and they are in demand from employers, that's wonderful, that's great. If they're going to help a student sort of succeed post-completion, that's great. But I think there's there's sort of increasing and mixed evidence about whether, you know, many of these shorter term programs actually aren't offering anything of any value. They're not offering skills that um, that students are finding useful in the labor market. And so that's scary. So they're not they're not even getting the degree, the four year degree that may not be a good proxy for skills, but at least is being used by employers in that way. So a lot of work to be done. So plus also, one and plus one. Thanks, Van. Uh, I, I do want to say that I share those concerns because if, uh, if, if anyone does a, a casual poll of, of people that they may work with, they may find out a lot of those individuals, though they have technical skill sets or have very marketable skills, um, actually have a bachelor's degree or a degree that came from a completely different subject area. And so skills are perishable, right? So you need to practice them in order to maintain them in a lot of cases. And the liberal arts and the performing arts uh, often prepare students to be able to learn and unlearn and relearn. Um, and I'm not just saying this full disclosure as someone who has a BFA in, in dance performance, uh, which I don't use every day on my job, but it, it does, uh, the arts and liberal studies, um, things that train you how to think, can allow you to get and trade skills um, uh, more easily throughout your career. So I, I'd like to see that and, and the curricular coherence that occurs over time to not be lost in the need to also develop skills. So I've got uh, Megan who is reminding us that our time is coming to a conclusion today. There are a whole heck of a lot of good questions that we didn't get to uh, that run the gamut from the role of OER in access and accessibility to master and model courses to faculty development to buy-in from faculty on predictive analytics to where does artificial intelligence fit in and how can online education help with uh, retraining workforces. So I suspect, uh, Megan, that um, 
you've got some ideas about how we may be able to do this and how WCET can keep this conversation going. You bet. First of all, I just want to thank you, Van, for keeping this group moving forward. We had way, way more questions than we could have gotten through in an hour presentation today. So I'll be sure to pull those questions out and get responses from our panelists, and we'll post those on the WCET website and possibly even in follow-up work from WCET. So again, thank you to all of our panelists. I just have a few closing notes here. Um, I scribbled many, many notes all over my paper here because we are developing a leadership summit coming up in June, and much of these topics of access and accessibility will be part of that. So I want to make sure that that's on your calendars June 5th through 6th, and then our 30th annual meeting is coming up in Portland, October 22nd through the 24th. Be sure to save both of those dates, and if you'd like more information or to get on future email distribution from WCET, you can enter the email address there, wcetinfo at wichi.edu. And again, this webcast will be posted on the WCET website. Feel free to access that web page and see um, some of the conversations from last year, including a reflection on what was going to take place in 2017 and what did and didn't occur. Thank you to WCET's supporting members and to our generous sponsors that underwrite much of our programming here at WCET. So we hope to see you on next month's webcast on the promise and peril of VR and AI in ed tech. So again, thank you all, wonderful presentation, great questions, and we'll see you soon.